In the world of precious metals, gold dominates, but it isn't the only precious metal out there. Silver, platinum and palladium are all investable precious metals, with physical exchange-ready products also available. Other precious metals, silver, platinum and palladium, tend to operate a little bit more like normal commodities, where this balance of supply and demand uh, tend to matter for the prices, whereas with gold, you, you tend to find prices uh, are dominated by macroeconomic variables. Welcome to the third episode of the Commodity Exchange, a podcast where we'll bring to you the insights from the world of commodities. Whether you're an investor or just want to learn more about commodities, this is the podcast for you. I'm Nita Shah, Head of Commodities and Macroeconomic Research here at Wisdom Tree. I'm pleased to be joined by James Steele, Chief Precious Metal Analyst at HSBC. Last month, we discussed gold as an investment. We hope to continue that conversation on gold and extend to other precious metals. And who better to help explore that topic than James Steele, a veteran of the bullion market from HSBC, one of the major bullion houses. Before I begin, I do need to state the following. To clarify, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Wisdom Tree and are subject to change. Anything we present in this podcast is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research, nor as investment or tax advice. The, inf the information and opinions expressed in this podcast are not, recommendation, are not a recommendation, offer or solicitation to buy or sell securities and reliance upon them is at the sole discretion of the listener. So in keeping with our normal uh, podcast format, I will give you a, a little up, uh, a recap of what's happened in the commodity markets over the last month uh, since our last recording. Uh, I'll keep it very short because we do have a treat. Uh, we've got James Steele here in studio today, so it'll be great to uh, get to speak to him very quickly. So in the past month, uh, commodities have had a turbulent time with broad commodity indices like the BCOM index uh, dropping close to 4%. Uh, industrial metals have led that decline and are close to 8% down on the month. But all subsectors, whether we look at energy, agricultural, or precious metals, are down. Um, precious metals is that bit more surprising because it has had a, um, a quite an exciting month. Uh, gold came close to 2050 on the 4th of May, uh, earlier this month. Um, and that had been on the back of earlier uh, uh, rallies in, in the bond market and uh, dollar depreciation. However, that has all come off. Uh, dollar has now appreciated again and, uh, and bond yields uh, spiked up over a time. And gold lost close to $100 uh, since that uh, near-term peak of 2050. And uh, as we speak, uh, the debt negotiations in the US look like they're going to come in close to completion. Um, a deal between uh, the White House and, uh, uh, and uh, it seems to be very close uh, to clinch and, uh, and Congress may, be, may, may approve it very quickly. Uh, and that could raise the debt ceiling until January next year. Elsewhere in the commodity markets, energy, as we noted, was down. Uh, but this weekend, uh, June the 4th, the OPEC and its partner countries are actually meeting to decide on production levels. And Saudi Arabia's energy minister, uh, Prince Abdullah bin Salman, has already warned short sellers to beware. Um, if you look at short positioning on both Brent and WTI uh, futures, they are looking excessively uh, stretched. And uh, that pessimism uh, could be shaken out with another cut by OPEC, uh, as we saw uh, just over a month ago. So with that quick roundup of uh, the commodity markets uh, behind us, uh, let's talk about precious metals. And welcome, James Steele. Thank you, Nitesh. You're most welcome. Uh, so let's start uh, firstly on gold. Um, so, you know, from from our standpoint, when we we as Wisdom Tree, where I exchange traded product uh, house, um, 
we think of most of our investors as you know ETP investors, but um, I guess gold investors are you know numerous, right? There are uh, different types of investors, uh, or are they, are they all a, a, a large homogenous group of people? You, you tell us who are gold investors. Well, gold investors really true, and and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to talk to your audience again. Um, uh, gold investors really cover the entire gambit. Uh, we have large institutional clients who are playing the market, portfolio managers, asset managers uh, who have, take a long-term view, insurance companies who take a very long-term view of the market. Uh, you could argue that central banks um, are investors in a sense, in the sense that uh, many of them have been buyers of gold recently. Uh, also, that moves right down uh, 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 the food chain, if you like, towards uh, a middle level uh, uh, investors, some small, some large, uh, that are active, for example, in the exchange traded funds uh, markets, the space that uh, that you're in, uh, uh, right down to uh, coin and bar buyers, uh, some of them uh, as small as five or 10 grams uh, uh, in a place like India, up to large kilo bars, uh, for, of course, very high net worth individuals or for uh, 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 corporations. Uh, they can store the gold physically. They can take it at home. Uh, uh, and really, we have a, an extremely wide, virtually millions upon millions of people uh, involved in the investment uh, uh, market of gold one way or another. And, and this doesn't even count, by the way, all the players in the gold market. Because don't forget, there's jewelry, there's the, the producers, there's the mining companies, there's the refiners, there's the recyclers, the fabricators, and there's the uh, 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 those that buy it for adornment, uh, not necessarily for, for investment. And so not even counting them, the investment side of the market is already very full and, and very varied. And I think that uh, uh, at whatever spectrum, you may, uh, whatever end of the spectrum you may be um, as an individual or, or as an institution, uh, gold probably has some merit somewhere or other. Wow. So it does look like there's a real large breadth of, uh, of, of investors in, in, in gold. And some, you wouldn't even, you know, it's, they don't necessarily define themselves as investors. They, the whole jewelry, but the whole jewelry for pseudo investment purposes right so it's um it, it is quite fascinating and it goes way beyond the world uh which you know we we look at in at, at wisdom tree maybe, maybe just to expand just on that little bit a wee bit uh that, that what you said there is really very telling many people in in in, in the so-called emerging or really non-oecd world um the the investment element to their jewelry consumption is inextricable. It's inextricably linked uh, to investment. It's not just adornment. And we see that repeatedly in Southeast Asia, in China, in the Middle East, in India, whereas jewelry demand in the West is almost strictly uh, a, a case of adornment, a luxury goods product. And so there is a, there is a difference in, in how these two uh, groups buy jewelry and how, and how they look at jewelry. So it's a very good point you just made, Natash. So James, you were in London uh, uh, quite recently, and you showed me some uh, amazing charts. Um, one was uh, looking at gold and real rates, and you know you showed me that uh, there's been a really strong negative correlation uh, between them for for decades. But recently, uh, things have been breaking down. Um, can you offer some of your thoughts on, on why that relationship between gold and real rates? Are, are more yes, indeed. And, and, it, and it really does tell a lot about the gold market. If you go back to the 1970s, um, you can see this inverse relationship, as you just pointed out, uh, between gold and real rates. So in which real rate are we talking about? Well, we've looked at a lot of different ones, as many other analysts have. And we found that the, the U.S. 10-year, so the, the, the real rate, that is to say, the, real, the rate uh, offered, the yield offered on the U.S. 10-year minus inflation expectations um, 
uh, is the best inverse uh, of correlation with gold. And the way we show it on our chart, actually, is to flip the uh, real rate round so you can see the, 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 uh, the, how, how close the relationship is. But suffice to say, when we had uh, uh, the global financial crisis and real rates went negative, uh, the gold market rallied. Uh, when we came out of that and real rates returned to more normal, uh, the gold market came down. And during COVID, we went strongly negative again and the gold market went up. Now, more recently, last year, rates moved back to being positive. And initially, gold did what one would have expected, which is to go down. But from the second, really the fourth quarter of last year, moving into this year, um, real rates have remained positive, but the gold market ceased to go down and started to rally. Why? Why, as you say, should this very strong and firm relationship that we've, that we've noted for decades break down or at least be dislocated? And that is because of the enormous, in our view, that is because of the very substantial bar, coin, jewelry, and central bank demand that came in and really offset what uh, heretofore has been a very strong relationship. Now, is this relationship going to disappear? Is it going to go you know, as Trotsky said, into the dustbin of history. Well, I don't think so. Um, there's too much evidence to, and too much economic rationale to imply uh, uh, that real rates will continue to, to have an influence on gold, but perhaps at different levels uh, than we've seen in the past. Uh, so I would expect it to go back. And one has to keep an eye on, on, on real rates going forward. But right now, that's a bit of a dislocation, that's for sure. And it's because of the underlying physical market. Wow, that's a great observation because uh, in our previous episode, we were going talking about some of the dynamics of, of the commodity markets. And, you know, when, historically, uh, using you know the quantitative analysis, looking at gold historically, we've demonstrated that gold tends to act more like a pseudo currency with other things driving uh, demand rather than physical demand. But now it looks like that, that physical demand component is becoming much, much more uh, important. Um, as, as we were discussing in this sort of intro comments, um, the US looks like it's coming close to uh, a debt deal being sealed. Um, what, what do you think that will do to gold? Um, you know, what your, your short-term thoughts on, on, on gold as, as a result of, of that deal coming uh, into play, if it does? Well, we, we, we had cautioned about the possibility of a gold drop um, uh, if the debt ceiling uh, uh, is resolved, issue is resolved. And we looked towards history. We looked towards the last time that uh, this happened, uh, that we were as close to the knife edge as we got this year. And that was back in 2011. And when uh, debt ceiling was, was met, uh, the gold market uh, uh, weakened thereafter quite considerably. Now, I think if you observe the markets today, uh, it doesn't look as if uh, it's had this impact. This may be because the market um, uh, correctly assumed that a resolution would have to be reached uh, in order to avoid, uh, these aren't my words, but the popular and the financial media was talking about calamity, catastrophe, uh, global meltdown, and such like. Not HSBC's words, I hasten to add, but what was in the press. So I think possibly some of the decline in the market that we'd already seen uh, heretofore may have been responsible uh, for expectations of, uh, of a resolution. But as it is now, also, we haven't gotten it through Congress yet. So the market may be holding judgment back a little bit. But a resolution to the debt ceiling, like um, a calming down in the regional bank uh, stresses in the US, um, are certainly not bullish for gold. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Absolutely. And more broadly, what, what is the relationship between government indebtedness and gold? Because presumably, once you take away the debt ceiling, that means 
you can inc increase uh, indebtedness to to a certain uh, degree. Um, what is the normal relationship between indebtedness and gold? Well, that's interesting because because one would look at it in two uh, aspects. You know, we have we have public debt, which is the debt run up by our various governments. And we have private debt, which is the debt that you and I have, and also Ford Motor Company or Samsung or any other. And I'm not choosing them because they're highly indebted. I don't think, I have no idea, but they're corporations that, 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 that may borrow on, on the open market. Um, mortgages, corporate stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have governments. Now, what's interesting is that I, I think all your, your viewers and listeners can certainly under, understand intuitively higher debt is good for gold. Uh, there's crowding out, uh, which in, affects uh, a private investment. Uh, there's the possibility of monetizing debt. There's the inflationary aspect of debt. There's uh, onerous uh, interest payments and all of these things um, and many others. There's been books written on this, by the way. Um, uh, are are theoretically good for gold and declines in debt are theoretically bad for gold prices. But gold seems to be much more sensitive. The point of this is it seems to be much more sensitive to public debt than it is to private debt. And I think that's because essentially the gold market is populated by free marketeers. Uh, it's one of the most perfectly free markets on the face of the earth to begin with. Um, and I think it's assumed that private debt will, to some degree, be reined in by the market. That, in other words, Nitesh Shah simply can't keep borrowing too much money. Jim Steele certainly can't. And uh, there's a limit to how much of a house I can buy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, similarly, corporations uh, can only raise so much uh, uh, debt as well. But we all know, so therefore, the gold market doesn't appear to be overly sensitive to increases or, or declines in, uh, in, in, in private debt. But we all know that governments have much more largesse than individuals, and they have much more ability, particularly the big governments, uh, of, of big governments of big economies. Uh, uh, and, 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 and what we've seen is that when we get rapid rises, not so much in debt, but look at it in debt against GDP. It's the debt to GDP ratio, because Debt depends on the size of the economy. Um, so when that advances rapidly, as it did during COVID, as it did during um, the global financial crisis, the gold market goes up quickly. But when it, stable, when it stabilizes, even if it doesn't go down, the gold market tends to stabilize as well. Well, right now, most countries are doing their best to pare back. I think it's fair to say that, uh, and I'm not looking at any individual country here, but if you, if, if you look at most of the big spending packages have been put through. And we're now in the post-COVID era uh, of, of, of fiscal retrenchment. Perhaps it looks as if the defense expenditures of a number of countries are going up. But other than that, debt to GDP ratios appear to be headed lower. And if that's the case, then that's at least going to, I'm not saying it's going to push gold lower, but it's going to take a tailwind Going to take some of that. It's going to create some headwinds to the gold market. Brilliant. So, um, I introduced you as uh, a veteran of the bullion market. Um, do tell us how long have you been analysing gold and the precious metal markets? Well, let's put it this way: um, my hair was gold when I first started covering this, and now. Uh, it's platinum or silver, take your pick. But it's a white metal, that's for sure. Um, I've been covering it since the 1980s. Um, I technically started covering it when I was at The Economist magazine uh, as a lowly uh, uh, statistician in the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit back in the 1980s when I looked at commodity producing countries. Um, but really, uh, more, more substantially uh, in the past, say, 30 years or so. Um, uh, half of that, at uh, more than half of that at HSBC. And, and actually, since HSBC, I've done nothing but precious metals. Uh, before I did, like you, I was a bit of a jack of all trades. But certainly in the past 
17, 18 years, it's been exclusively precious metals. Which is a great advantage uh, being a veteran of these things because um, when you get to a point of very wow. long bear and bull markets, one has the ability to remember when the markets were bearish or were bullish uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, I don't recommend anybody getting old, but in the sense of being able to cover commodities, uh, the ability to, to, to summon uh, events in your mind when we had the last and, and, and what derailed those bullish and bearish uh, rallies uh, uh, is important uh, to remember also. Wow. Wow. And so how has analyzing these markets changed over time? Is there, um, you know, do, do people look at these markets in a different way or, you know, it's been, these markets have been around for several millennia. I mean, uh, are we analyzing them the same way they were uh, done a uh, hundred thousand years ago? Well, it's very interesting that you, that you would say this because um, uh, one of the hardest things to be uh, for any in any quasi academic or research work um, is originality. It's almost impossible to be original. And if you look at gold and silver, I believe gold is mentioned more than forty times in the in in, in the Hebrew Bible, and uh, silver is mentioned over sixty times in the Bible. Um, it's mentioned in the Quran. Uh, both metals are mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. In, in, in Buddhist texts as well. So uh, we've been writing about gold. You, one can find extensive uh, accounting for gold and silver uh, uh, in, in papyrus in ancient Egypt and Babylon, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very hard to be original because someone has been writing about it, looking for it, mining it, talking about it for 5,000 years of human history. Um, now, on that, topic, uh, one of the things that we sort of struck upon uh, uh, as a different way of looking at the market was to look at it through the prism of global trade. And uh, uh, because, well, you know, one can talk about interest rates in the dollar uh, equity markets. We, we constantly look at these things and their impact on gold. But we thought that if we looked at it through, the, through, through trade, it might yield some additional light on, on, onto the gold market. And when global trade uh, grows at a level above global GDP, so say global GDP is growing at 2 or 3% and trade is growing at 4 or 5 economists tell us a number of things happen. They tell us that inflation is likely to fall as the cheapest goods and services or, 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 or more of the cheapest goods and services are being freely traded, that income is likely to go up. Also, that due to the law of comparative advantage, countries that adopt trade most aggressively, such as South Korea or Germany, will grow quickly. That um, also that uh, equity markets are likely to do well, led by uh, export-led companies, say like Samsung or Microsoft or Daimler. Uh, also, that the uh, dollar, U.S. dollar, is likely to be strong because the bulk of trade is conducted in dollars. So there's a constant dollar bid uh, in the global markets. And um, global risks are likely to decline uh, uh, because one generally has good relations with, with one someone that you trade with. So if I were to say to you all of those things, inflation is going to go down, the US dollar is going to be strong, your equity market is going to, or your stock market is going to go higher, um, your income is likely to rise, your employment steady, uh, and global risks are going to decline. How much gold would you like? Well, you might not want much. Um, and, and during those periods, gold tends to be rather low. But when trade, trade is volatile, global trade is volatile, we know that. When trade contracts, um, the gold market takes off like a rocket. Uh, Bit of a lag, six months. It doesn't happen instantaneously. But if you look at during COVID and you look during the global financial crisis and you look at the period in between, the global market, a gold soared, moderated, soared again. Now, recently, global trade has had a few problems again. And we know we're coming up to a period of elections 
uh, many countries. And I'm, you know, you know, it's completely unfair uh, and biased to point to any two countries that have trade problems. In actual fact, trade frictions are global uh, and between between uh, uh, countries that you're very friendly with, countries you're less friendly with. And uh, if we get further trade frictions, um, then I think that could be supportive of the gold market. But it's an interesting way to look wow. at it. It's a that slightly is, uh, off center way of analyzing the gold market. That is an amazing observation. And uh, like, like you say, it's a very original piece from you. I've heard it from uh, many other uh, people. So um, hats off to you. on. Well, that. you know, Nitesh, I, I sit in my little room like a monk cell and try to think of these things. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job at it. Um, I guess another thing you, you guys at HSBC uh, get a get a great uh, vista on is um, you know the, the physical markets. Um, so as as you mentioned, you know the uh, India and China are key uh, physical markets uh, for, for bullion. Um, tell us about some of the observations you've been seeing over there recently uh, in both of those uh, both of those regions. Uh, what, what, what's what's been happening since? 2002, and uh, is any of that uh, changing uh, pace in 2023? Well, if you look at India and China, just taking those countries um, together, they account for 50% of all the physical gold put, uh, demand in the world. Enormous, an absolutely enormous uh, amount. Uh, there's uh, not just in those two countries, but in many countries around the world, there's a deep cultural affinity towards gold. Um, it's used uh, uh, as a mixture of, of, of investment and adornment and wealth preservation. It's seen as a quality asset. Uh, but we are talking about countries uh, in the non-OECD world that have lower disposable incomes and therefore are more price sensitive. And we're certainly seeing, especially with the tax increase in uh, India last year, uh, a, 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 some uh, a hit on, on, on import demand. Now, India doesn't have any gold mines of her own, uh, despite being a phenomenally uh, uh, active country in, in bullion, uh, doesn't produce any gold herself. Um, and so therefore, the additional demand is all, is all imported. And that has dropped. Um, uh, a 10 gram bar, which is a typical bar that's purchased uh, in India, is well over 60,000 rupees. I think it's around 62,000, uh, but don't quote me on that exact number, but it's it's high, it's over 60. And for a long time, it was between 25 and 35,000 rupees. So, I mean, you can imagine. Um, uh, Indian demand is uh, linked also, uh, or at least a portion, a good portion of Indian demand is linked towards the monsoon. Uh, because uh, much of uh, gold is purchased in the rural tribal belt, which is uh, dependent upon agricultural income, and the agricultural harvest is dependent in turn on the monsoon. So we'll see how that progresses this year. Um, but right now, it's been a bit tough for India. Now, in China, we've also seen uh, a jump in gold prices, uh, but they have come out of lockdown. Um, so there's a lot of pent-up demand. Uh, but I would expect um, that the uh, Chinese demand may also have to begin to moderate, uh, given given the high price. I think that's uh, uh, that's likely to occur. Now, very recently, demand in both countries has picked up a wee bit. I'm talking about very recently, but I think it's uh, that may have been in reaction to well over a hundred dollar decline from from the highs. And I think it's historically, it's fair to say that uh, uh, in most countries outside of the OECD world, gold is expensive. Um, it's impacting jewelry demand, coin demand, and bar demand. Uh, that in turn is going to create some overhead that the investment side of the market is going to have to absorb unless prices recalibrate lower. And I think we may already have seen some of that recalibration. Wow. I think this uh, may be a good time to talk about some of the other precious metals. Um, you know, other precious metals could be seen as uh, substitutes for, for gold. Um, 
how about silver? Uh, high gold prices last year, taxes in India. Um, how has that impacted the silver market? Yes, uh, one of the things uh, that was interesting in regards to, to India uh, was a, a virtual massive explosion in, in silver demand. Um, and that was very logical because the uh, Indian government, the Ministry of Finance, uh, put an additional import tax on on gold. And so the market responded uh, by reducing gold demand, but shifting that demand, still requiring precious metals and shifting that demand towards uh, gold sister metal, silver. Now, as one might expect, uh, more recently, the Indian government has now put a similar tax uh, on silver. So we may see something of a drop uh, uh, in silver demand uh, this year. Uh, but I think the big uh, difference is the uh, uh, industrial element of both metals, uh, 47, 48%, a little bit shy of half of uh, silver is for industry, whereas uh, I think less than 8% now of gold goes into industry. So this is, this, this is the big difference between the two. Jewelry is only about 19%. Uh, uh, for silver, whereas it's 50% for, 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 uh, uh, for gold. Though coins and bars are, are pretty important. Um, jewelry and silverware together are almost as much as coins and bars together. They're about, they're roughly equal with a wee sliver for photographic demand. Now, what I like about silver, um, is the industrial applications. Um, uh, and, and, and what, we think is that the silver demand this year for industry is going to be quite good. And we believe it's going to grow at a rate well out above uh, global industrial demand. So if we, we're looking for silver to be about 5% higher in the industrial demand for silver, uh, industrial production is going to be considerably below that, according to our economists and 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 I think the indications are, are that that's that's right um, so why is silver going to be greater well because the applications that silver is being is, is most required for are growing at an outsized rate that's photovoltaic uh, 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 demand that's very strong um, we've done a lot of thrifting uh, in that regard we're down to as little silver as we can use per panel and the demand is still going up. Uh, we have subsidies from many countries, uh, and uh, we are searching for alternate energy. And this is, uh, this is a big demand source, a big growing demand source for silver. There's a whole range of, 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 of applications, uh, biomedical uh, applications, uh, water treatment systems, um, all sorts of things in that regard are increasing silver demand. Uh, silver is used in minute amounts in electronics. Um, nobody ever didn't make a car because the silver price was too high. Uh, so the price is a relatively inelastic. Uh, the demand, I'm sorry, is relatively uh, insensitive to price uh, in the industry because it's used in only tiny, tiny parts per application. Um, and as electronics comes back, and many, many other things that uh, we could spend the whole hour talking about, actually. Um, all of that together is going to, in our view, raise um, industrial demand for silver by tens of millions of ounces. Uh, and will will offset, uh, largely, uh, any decline we may see in bar and coin demand this year. Wow. So there's quite a large energy transition, uh, renewable energy theme uh, to, to, to silver. I guess that would possibly break some of the trends that we've seen in the past. I mean, I guess if you're looking at silver markets 10, 20 years ago, you'd be, you know, quite concerned about how much units of silver are going into uh, things like, you know, photography. Uh, but that's no longer a thing people even uh, assess anymore, right? It, that, that, that industry has gone into decline. But uh, I guess photovoltaics and uh, electronics application is possibly the, the big growth areas. Maybe if we move on to um, another group of, uh, of, of precious metals, uh, platinum group metals. 
Um, and on that point, uh, you were here in London just uh, just over a week ago, uh, close to two weeks ago now, um, for the London Platinum and Palladium uh, Week. Um, and it was a great pleasure seeing you at the time. Uh, I was wondering, could you summarize for our audience um, what was the mood like uh, during that week, and what are what are your key takeaways uh, from that week long of of events? Well, I think I think we had a positive mood, uh, particularly as regards platinum uh, uh, going forward. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that this is all very immediate, but I think um, uh, between the two medals, uh, you know, for most of my career, again showing my age here, um, platinum traded at a considerable premium to Palladium. Um, and for most of the history of the two medals, Platinum was a lot higher. But in the last number of years, Palladium has gone to a considerable uh, premium to, to Platinum. Uh, and that's because of the great demand in uh, automobiles. Uh, well, what we are seeing now, and I think has become more apparent and as was discussed uh, uh, on Platinum Week, uh, is that um, despite massive reserves, uh, there's limited uh, 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 outlook for supply um, from South Africa. Uh, the mines there do a magnificent job in very difficult, and I want to make that very clear, the mines do a great job in very difficult circumstances. Uh, there's uh, 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 trained personnel, um, there's uh, some water issues, uh, uh, but most of all there's uh, uh, I wouldn't say sporadic, but there's tight power supplies. Let's put it that way. And this is sort of curbing output. Um, uh, just at the time when platinum demand uh, is rising, it's rising because uh, some of the, uh, uh, in, in for some elements in autocatalytic converters, one can substitute uh, basically one ounce, a one for one, one ounce of platinum for one ounce of palladium. Palladium is considerably higher, so it makes a lot of sense to do that. And we've had hundreds of thousands of ounces have been uh, transferred from one to the other. And that has uh, a marked uh, uh, impact on supply demand uh, balances uh, to the favor of platinum. Um, it's also possible that uh, after many years of decline, um, we did see higher platinum uh, demand out of a jewelry uh, demand out of China last year. Uh, China is about 70% of platinum demand, um, of platinum jewelry demand. Um, and uh, it is a reasonably close second. It is the second largest uh, net uh, uh, jewelry demand. It's the second largest consumer. Uh, it's not talked about nearly as much as autos, but it's very important. Uh, we think that might be bottoming out, maybe, maybe going up a little bit. And for all the other non-auto industrial elements. Uh, we uh, uh, were extremely positive on, um, on platinum. Uh, now, the, the, the near-term outlook for the palladium also looks uh, positive, but it is important to, to note that we are likely to be moving uh, from a period of prolonged uh, deficits in the uh, palladium towards a more balanced market next year and the years after, uh, while we're still looking for, uh, well, we're looking for shifts from long-term surpluses in platinum towards greater deficits, both this year and next year, uh, which is going to lead us, we think, to platinum gaining on, on palladium overall. One of the other things, of course, is that supply, supply out of uh, Russia has continued to, to, to meet the global markets. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the, uh, the big concern on the supply side. Um, thinking once again about demand, I mean, I think um, uh, one of the possible tailwinds for uh, platinum will be the hydrogen economy because platinum is used for both for um, producing green hydrogen, the electrolyzing process, um, and also in uh, the PET membranes that are used in uh, fuel cells. Um, what's what's your opinion there? Will will the hydrogen economy be, be enough to offset the losses for platinum units going into internal combustion engine vehicles, say in, in a decade or so? It is very hard. It is very hard to say. 
It is extremely hard to say, and perhaps I should maybe mention uh, electric vehicles uh, in the same breath. Um, <coughs> excuse me. As I don't want this to sound just like a glad fest for platinum. Um, electric vehicles, and we take the growth in electric vehicles uh, into account in our supply-demand balances when we try to calculate what we think uh, and forecast what we think demand will be. Electric vehicles do not use any PGMs. Uh, they do use silver, however. They use a lot of silver um, compared to petroleum cars. Uh, or they use more, I should say. Um, now, electric vehicles don't use any PGMs. So one has to take that into account. Now, <coughs> I beg your pardon, excuse me. Hydrogen vehicles would theoretically make quite a dent, uh, uh, increase demand considerably. But we don't know yet how much. There is a lot of research going into it. Um, the whole area of environmental uh, issues, I mean, whether even if we don't have hydrogen power vehicles, um, the fact that, you know, regulations keep getting tighter uh, and loadings are pretty heavy uh, for are, are growing uh, 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 from uh, 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 even higher loadings before, um, that is all positive. Um, the potential for hydrogen is certainly considerable, but we're still we're still just before we can really make any kind of a solid determination on that. And I, I certainly wouldn't want to create a false dawn uh, over, over this, but it looks positive, but, but, but we can't be concrete enough yet. Wow. So there's some amazing insights into the world of uh, precious metals. Thank you so much, uh, James, for joining us today. And I hope that this is the uh, first of many. Uh, so once again, really want to thank you uh, for, for, for joining. Um, and I also want to thank our audience for uh, tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode of the Commodity Exchange. If you want to hear more from us, please do subscribe on whatever platform you're using. You can follow us on Twitter at Nitesh Shah WT and my co-host who's normally on the show, uh, Mobin Tahir WT. Um, and if you want to learn more about commodities, uh, do visit Wisdom Tree's website where we have a wide range of research materials and insights. Until next time, thank you very much.